I posted a video a little while ago about us doing, you know, observing the Lord's Supper in an incorrect way. When I got done with the video, I went and tried to and put this into practice. So I went and ate something, but I wasn't quite feeling it. It wasn't quite registering, resonating with my heart. And I think part of that reason is that we really have to revisit what got established initially. And since none of us have really participated in animal sacrifices, we have to walk through that. What would that have been like, right? There was a morning sac sacrifice. There was a an evening sacrifice. That evening sacrifice, by the way, took place at 3 p.m. And we know that that was at the exact time that Jesus died. In any event, when you went to the temple to sacrifice, that became food. Food for those who worked at the temple and also food for those who were visiting the temple. And so if you were sitting down for a meal to eat and participate in that sacrifice, you're participating in that sacrifice because you're eating that sacrifice. And likewise, you're participating in the sacrifice with Jesus because you're eating. He has to become a part of you. And so as you are, as you would be sacrificing that animal and laying those sins on that animal, being cleansed by that, by the blood of that animal, you would be very aware of appreciation and gratitude for the sacrifice that that animal just made for you. Unfortunately, we don't seem to have that kind of an appreciation for Jesus. And this was happening over and over every time a sacrifice was made their hearts were being trained to appreciate that sacrifice. That's what the Lord's Supper in part is supposed to be doing, is reminding you of the covenant that you've made with Christ and appreciating that sacrifice. So when Christ says that you are to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and then and he gives that teaching, and then he tells his apostles the night before he dies, this is the blood of the covenant. And he breaks the bread and he says, you know, distribute this amongst yourselves. They're eating of one loaf representing one church. We're all partaking in the flesh of Christ. And man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He is the manna from heaven that is given on a daily basis. Your daily bread, your daily manna. And while giving that teaching regarding being the bread of life... He said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna from heaven and they died. Do not pursue bread that spoils, but bread that leads to eternal life. Teaching, doctrine, that's what is sustaining your soul. That is what's nourishing your spiritual life. How do we put this into practice? Well, it's going to be a little learning curve at first when you're sitting down. But one of the things that Jesus always did was he would give thanks. The word is always saying after he gave thanks. And of course we do that as well. But as we're giving thanks, you're probably going to notice that you start to feel different differently in your prayers. Just like when I gave, you know, when I taught you about what it means to be in the name and I stopped praying, you know, ending my prayers in, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It changed my prayers. It slowed me down because now when I feel that kind of like habit where I want to say in the name of Jesus Christ, what I'm doing is I, I stop myself and I orient myself around what it means to be in the name. And the natural thing that comes out of me is, Lord, keep me in your name. Keep teaching me. Keep moving me. Keep bringing me as low as I've got to go in order to be in the right posture to remain in your name. So I suspect that my prayers are going to ch really change again from here on out because you can't sit down at a meal and not think about that sacrifice. I mean, that's, you know, that's part of the reason why eating was established. We didn't have to eat. God didn't have to design us to eat, but he established that to help us to understand certain things, to help us to understand the sacrifice what sustains our soul. He taught us about clean and unclean foods so that we could understand God's people versus the Gentiles, Jews from Gentiles and also clean from unclean. And then of course he fulfilled that because through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Gentiles are engrafted in. So if you're still practicing this idea of unclean food, you're not understanding how you have been made clean as a Gentile. You're not understanding that fulfillment. And that's something you might need to understand that that has been fulfilled. Otherwise, if you're still practicing that, then under the law that you're returning yourself to, you as a Gentile are not actually clean.
right? Because that's what he talked with Peter about. That was the entire purpose of separating clean from unclean foods. That was made very clear in that vision. So Paul says that whatever you're doing, whether you're eating or drinking or whatever it is you're doing, always glorify God. Obviously, the Lord's Supper does talk about bread and wine, and these would have been staples in their diet. So after the meal, they would have had a glass of wine. Bread would have been a staple food. But also lamb represents Christ. So it is important that we're doing these things, but you can do this in any food that you're eating. You just need to remind yourself and remember that the body is eating from one loaf. And so as as the church would be pulling from that one loaf, they'd be looking at that loaf and considering the entire body. They'd be looking at that loaf and saying, okay, how much, how much do I pull in order for this bread to, you know, be enough for everyone around the table. You can also do that. You can use that principle in your your meals with your family. You're passing around that food, right? And you're considering, okay, how do I ration this? How do I consider everyone at the table? It'd be quite obnoxious if one person was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to take half of the potatoes when there's eight people at the table. You're going to take half and then make the other seven people pick from the half that's remaining. No, you don't do that. You consider everyone at the table. You have concern, just like the high priest had concern for the whole body when he was doing that sacrifice for everyone. What was the body doing? Well, they're withholding from their themselves while the high priest is doing that sacrifice. These are important things for us to be observing. As you observe this, while you, as you're eating with your family or, you know, I eat alone. I don't have anyone to eat with, but these are the things that I will be thinking about and I will be praying in a very different way. And I think that naturally what's going to come from me, at least right now in the beginning, is first of all, thanking the father for his sacrifice and also the sacrifice of his son. And I say his sacrifice because he sacrificed his son. So he also sacrificed. I'm going to naturally be praying for wisdom and understanding. Help me to get into the right posture to appreciate the sacrifice that was made on my behalf. I have a feeling that the Lord is going to speak with me as I'm eating, as I'm pursuing his heart, and I'm going to be reviewing that covenant. And so it's really going to slow me down. It's going to slow me down in my eating process. Hey, that's not a bad thing. But I just wanted to give you a practical way, a way of actually applying this to your life. Because it's no good if it's just ritual. If we're not pursuing his heart, then what does it, what does it matter? It's not going to be to our credit. Everything is fulfilled in love. And so if we love him, we're going to be pursuing his heart. I hope that helps to clarify things and make it a little bit more practical and applicable and meaningful. I want to mention one more thing that I think is going to be important for some of you to understand. If you have issues with food, if you've had had issues with compulsivity, you may end up noticing that some strongholds start coming up. You might even feel compelled to start eating in compulsive ways. And what you need to recognize there is that there might be a spirit. There might be a spirit attached to this. And I want to tell you something, if the devil has done all of this work to try to distract and distort this doctrine or this practice, this observance of the Lord's Supper, if he's been doing that, it's important to him. And so he might be lurking around these corners of your life. You might sit down and feel like you want to distract, like you're used to using technology when you eat. You're used to watching a show. You're used to overindulging. So pay attention to what comes up for you. Pay attention if there's any kind of impulsive or compulsive behaviors that come up because there may be a stronghold that you didn't realize. That's going to be important to track. And so if that's something that you're struggling with, you might need to do a fast and you might need to return to him and repent for whatever is connected to that, which means you examine, all right, where's this coming from? You dig that root out, you expose it, and you change. All right, I think I covered some important bases. If you have any questions, ask them in the comments section. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.